Welcome everyone. This is John Vinson with the Arkansas Pharmacists Association. And I want to just thank everyone for being here today for our webinar that we've communicated out to um, APA members as well as uh, other friends in, in Arkansas to discuss a, a very exciting and important concept around community pharmacy services. And I first want to introduce uh, Dr. Scott Pace. CEO and Executive Vice President of the Arkansas Farm Association. He wants to say a few opening comments. Good afternoon, everybody. I just wanted to say a quick thank you to each of you for taking the time out this afternoon to listen and learn from our colleagues in North Carolina about the Enhanced Pharmacy Services Network that they have been building out uh, in their state for the last couple of years. We're going to have a, a couple of participants, Ashley Branham and Joe Moose from Community Care of North Carolina, who are going to be able to give us some uh, insights and some tips and tricks as we uh, work on uh, building out a similar model in our state. So uh, this is going to be a very important initiative for the Pharmacist Association in Arkansas over the next several years. Dr. Vinson is going to uh, lead our efforts on this, and we're just really excited to have such a great turnout for the first uh, kickoff webinar. So uh, thank you to each of you and please let uh, us in our office know if there's anything that we can do to answer your questions in the coming weeks and months. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you all at district meetings over the next six weeks. So John, take it away. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Pace. And just want to remind everyone as well that this session is being recorded. This is the first of three webinars. This one today is a um, a learning opportunity, an overview, a big picture um, concept of, of what this Enhanced Services Network is. We're going to follow up in the next month with two additional webinars. The second will drill down into more details about quality and analysis of the Enhanced Services Network. And the third is going to be a question and answer and a frequently asked questions webinar, live seminar with the ability to drill down into more uh, detail for uh, things that come up between now and then. So we look forward to to getting these going. I'm John Vinson with the Arkansas Farm Association. I'm the Vice President of Practice Innovation at the Pharmacists Association and been working here for about six months now and prior to that had over a decade of experience in um, patient-centered medical homes as well as community pharmacy in Alma, Arkansas and Fort Smith. So I'm, I'm happy to be here today. I'm very excited about this and have uh, quite a background in quality improvement initiatives and, and some of the CMS innovation projects like the Comprehensive Primary Care Initiative. Ashley Branham and Joe Moose are also on the line and Ashley is going to do the, the bulk of the presenting um, about Community Pharmacy Enhanced Services Network and she's going to pick up in the middle and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about her in a minute. I want to start by saying, though, that these are the things in this overview that at the Arkansas Pharmacy Association, as we had an opportunity over the last few months to, um, to review this um, initiative, <clears throat> that were important to us to understand and learn. And I think it sets the stage to why we think this is a good idea and want to be part of it. Um, we're going to talk about what this is, who should be a part of it, how's the governance going to work, why would we partner with North Carolina, is there any, you know, is there a business reason to do this or a professional reason why this might make sense, what's the timeline look like, and who are some Arkansas-based partners and resources that will help us with this enhanced services network. So those are the key questions and points that we want to try to address today. And th there will be other questions I'm sure that you'll have, and we'll be happy to address those as, as we get to them. I'm going to look at the chat and the questions in a minute after I go through a few slides and as right before we introduce Ashley. From my point of view or from APA's point of view, the way we understand it is a community pharmacy enhanced services network is a quality initiative uh, focusing on community pharmacy services above and beyond our core dispensing services of filling prescriptions and, and ensuring that the prescriptions themselves are safe and effective to use at the point of care. It's those things that you do above and beyond core dispensing services, including um, immunization, 
you know, determining which immunizations make sense and then uh, making those available um, through protocols, uh, medication synchronization with review, and medication reconciliation after transitions of care. Those are just a few examples, and you're going to hear Ashley's going to drill down a lot further um, later on in the presentation. The goals of this enhanced service network are going to, um, to not only establish this value quality driven pharmacy representation in a community setting to patients, payers, populations, and other healthcare professionals, but also internally increase opportunities for professional satisfaction and new business opportunities for pharmacists as healthcare providers. And then finally, as the uh, network will grow, we hope that, that pharmacists in the network um, will be able to secure funding contracts and participation from payers and ACOs and provider referral networks for clinical services and innovative reimbursement opportunities. So those are the overarching goals. <clears throat> Who will join? We're going to seek the, the network, not we, but the network, the self-governing network will seek high integrity pharmacies and pharmacists who have demonstrated an interest in high quality patient-centered care that value, that offers valuable patient care services that extend those traditional core dispensing services, which are still very much important. They're, they're, it's the core of what we do, but <clears throat> being able to measure those uh, other services that you provide that um, provide enhanced outcomes for patients uh, and quality improvement efforts. How does the governance work? You know, initially the governance is going to be self-governed by members of the network. So these are practicing community pharmacists, pharmacy owners, and pharmacy um, decision makers within um, small chains, large chains, community pharmacy groups um, that have the ability to make decisions about what the network will actually provide, what services will be uh, required, what services are optional, and how they're measured. And we'll talk a little bit about how those people will, you know, potentially be luminaries and, and fit into work groups that will make those decisions. And we'll let um, uh, Ashley drill down a little bit further uh, later. This <clears throat> this slide <clears throat> about the medical neighborhood. Ashley, would you comment about this slide for me? Absolutely. So this is just an illustration to demonstrate kind of the structure that we have in mind and that we've developed in North Carolina and, and also um, helped facilitate in other states as well, starting with the core of uh, participating pharmacies, identifying who those are in, the, in, in your state, um, who believe that they are um, really um, providing services that um, go toward reducing total cost of care in patients and providing value to the medical neighborhood. So um, we start with really trying to recruit those high-performing community pharmacies that want to be value players in the, in the medical neighborhood. From there, we begin to identify um, volunteers within those pharmacies that will um, um, kind of serve in a work group capacity um, to um, to break out into kind of a network operations group, a quality assurance and performance group, and a service sets work group, where a lot of these core decisions about who you are, what your brand is going to be, and what value you're going to bring to the medical neighborhood will start to come out. Critical to the development of a CPESN um, is the identification of luminaries. And so these are the, the one or two or three or four um, strong, high integrity um, pharmacists, business owners likely in, in, your, in your state that can go out, recruit, and identify other high-performing pharmacies um, to, um, to the network. 
you also have kind of a capacity of the local CPSN that provides the, the network structure. So what happens if a payer comes on board? Um, who will hold that contract and how will um, and who will be the point of contact for potential value purchasers that will want to interact with you? And so um, and then there's also um, the opportunity for CPSN collaborators and partners, perhaps at schools of pharmacy, um, state associations, for example, in this capacity. Um, or um, medical societies, anybody who would help to support your CPSN. Think of it as you're bringing in your all-stars together in the state. Who are the strong leaders that can make this network successful? Another question that's commonly going to be asked, is there going to be revenue to pay for these enhanced services, or is this enhanced services network going to provide new revenue or new business opportunities? There's three ways that could potentially happen. One, in my mind, one is from increased referrals from provider networks, health systems, physicians, nurse practitioners, and patients themselves. You're going to have increased marketing and visibility. Also, you're going to be having discussions with high performers that, that hopefully some of the support you will get and practice transformation support, you'll get increased efficiencies and better use of your time, resources, and staff you know, for providing those services, you're going to learn from best case scenarios of, of how to operate. And then, um, a, and then long term, we hope that a commit, a, our, our vision is that a commitment to quality improvement, population health, will open doors for enhanced payment models uh, by payers. Why well, partner with North Carolina? <clears throat> well, the, the biggest reason is because they've been there, done this, they are the experts in this concept. Um, they've received um, funding from CMS in their own state to, to grow and improve what they've been working on. Um, their community care in North Carolina has been around for 25 plus years and the Enhanced Services Pharmacy Network concept has been around for uh, since I believe early 2014. Is that right, Ashley? Correct. Yeah. And the good work that they've been able to do resulted in, in a pretty substantial CMS uh, grant that helped um, to, to build it out further, to develop marketing tools, um, to provide expertise and transformation support to other states like Arkansas. Um, you'll find out a little bit later there's a, a several, more than a dozen states that are interested that they're working with. But more specifically, they can provide help with expertise, expertise consulting, uh, marketing development, webinars like this, live meetings and work groups to facilitate, you know, development and maturation of the network, um, graphic design for branding, logos, uh, help us develop maps and collaboration cards, and survey the participants of the network. So. Uh, those are just some specific examples of things that will happen as part of partnering with North Carolina. But the most important part in my mind is the expertise and the consulting from Ashley and Joe and, and others from North Carolina. The timeline to be able to do this within the, the confines of that innovation grant, they have secured funding for about 15 more months till the end of 2017. And it typically takes from the times you're having these first conversations about eight months to launch it. And so if we're going to partner with North Carolina, which APA strongly feels that, that we should, but it's going to take grassroots efforts from the practicing community pharmacists to make it happen, it'll take around eight months. It can happen quicker, but that's just the typical time that, that they've seen with the few of the early adopters in early states. They have applied for additional funding beyond 2017, but that you know, we don't know yet if that's going to be approved or not by CMS Innovation Center. And then the last thing I want to say before introducing Ashley to give you more specifics about the, the big picture that we've already discussed is that the Arkansas Pharmacists Association and Pharmacy Foundation are committed to this, are providing um, information on how to launch this network. The UAMS College of Pharmacy and Harding College of Pharmacy are both um, supportive. Arkansas State Board of Pharmacy, actually John Kirtley, Dr. Kirtley's here with us live at 417 uh, South Victory here in Little Rock uh, on the webinar um, this afternoon. 
Northeast Arkansas Baptist Memorial and Baptist out of Memphis. Uh, you'll hear more about that. And of course, there are going to be others to be determined. But there's a lot of initial support into doing this. And we hope that you'll see that and, and take advantage of that. With that, I want to formally um, introduce Ashley. We're very happy and pleased to have Dr. Branham on the call today and to help us lead through this and drill down to the details of how this is going to work. And she's been working, <clears throat> well, her background is working in Moose Pharmacy with, with Dr. Joe Moose out of Concord, North Carolina. But she also is the Director of Network Development and Marketing of the Multi-State Community Pharmacy Learning Collaborative. <clears throat> in short, she's in charge of working with, with us to figure this out if Arkansas is going to do this. She's, she will assist with the development of the, of the network in Arkansas as well as others across the nation. She's a University of Kentucky graduate from 2004. Um, as well as received her doctorate of pharmacy from Campbell in 2008, and she completed a community pharmacy residency um, in UNC Eshelman School of Pharmacy in North Carolina and Moose Pharmacy in Concord. She also completed a, 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 a second-year community pharmacy residency, a postgraduate residency, um, with uh, the same group in 2010. And we're so happy to have you here today, Ashley, and tell us more. I'm going to. Uh, you want me Absolutely. to? Absolutely. Would you like for me to drive the slides or, or turn them over to you? Yeah. I'll let you drive them and I'll just tell you when to advance forward. Sounds good. Um, Thank you know, thanks for having us today. And, and we're, we're, uh, Joe and I are glad to be here. We, um, we have the opportunity um, um, to kind of to work with a lot of pharmacists and community pharmacists around the nation. and. We're feeling we're feeling urgency with these types of, of networks. We're seeing a um, kind of an evolution of payment model as health reform um, kicks off. We're seeing a um, um, kind of a build up of opportunities within the medical benefit side of, of um, ACOs um, and, and other value partners are looking for community pharmacies that will help. Um, Man, help them manage a really tough patient population. And um, the payment models are evolving. They're slowly evolving, but they're having difficulty um, uh, um, finding community pharmacies that are out there partnering um, that will have the appetite to participate in something like this. And so that's the value of developing these networks, that there's opportunity to connect you, um, the pharmacy that's really making a big difference and working with your patients on, on every level to make sure they have access to the right and appropriate medications um, and um, in doing so in a way that can keep your bills paid every um, every month. And so um, I'm, I'm going to turn this section over to Joe who's going to kind of talk through um, some of the healthcare spin and the threats to community pharmacy and then I'll pick back up with a couple examples of, of how this network plays out um, in real life. Thank you, Ashley. Um, so if we think of, of all the health care in your state or in the nation costing $100, about $10 of that is spent on pharmacy and pharmacists, um, depending on who the payer is, if it's Medicaid, that $10 may be a little less than that, somewhere in the $5 or $6 range. If it's a private uh, insurance that has a healthy population, it may be somewhere around the 28 dollar range, but, but just in general it's $10. The rest of the health care spending goes to hospitalization, ED visits, diagnostic testing, um, office visits, things, things built around that. And that's where we, the bulk of all the spending in health care is. So uh, when we as pharmacists are working at the top of our license and, and the top of our capability and catching drug interactions and and finding patients who uh, discontinue therapy for chronic diseases on their own uh, and are, or have diabetes but quit taking medication for it, or we uh, find out that a patient, the reason they have not been adherent to their medication is because they didn't have transportation and couldn't get to the pharmacy and, and we get them access to the medication. What we're really doing is, is our effect is, is shown in this $90 piece of pie. So the real value we bring when we're working at the top of our license are reduction in the, in the $90 piece of pie. But today, 
we get paid through the PBM model and all our payment comes out of the $10 piece of pie. So our, our real goal, and I think all this slide is super, super simple, I think that is really at the core uh, principle of what we're talking about with the, the CPESN and what we're talking about with this uh, where community and pharmacy needs to go. And it's that everything we do affects the $90 piece of pie. We should be working to get paid from the $90 piece of pie. And, and that's a lot what we'll talk about today. Next slide, please. So what are the two, two major problems we face? What do I face every day in keeping the doors open? My pharmacy one is that we can't sell drugs below cost. So when, when reimbursement is, is, keeps going down and it's gone down, uh, we've got other graphs we could show you, it's gone down consistently over the past 15 years. Every year it's reduced and there hasn't been any, any upticks and I don't know of any data that would suggest that, it's, that that course is changing. Um, DIR fees come in, into play and bring it down even below cost even more. And then there are narrow networks out there. So things are getting funneled off into a specialty network or you can't get on uh, with that contract where you don't have access. It's only, it's only the only people who have access to that particular are those that are in network. So next slide. Um, so what you end up with is, is a situation where uh, you don't have access to the patient so it really doesn't matter what the AWP is or what NADAC is if the patient doesn't even come to you. So we put a lot of energy in the past in, in fighting those AWP, NADAC type battles and I still still think that it's worth fighting but um, what we're trying to get at is if we become the narrow network, if we become the value proposition to the, to the majority of the spending, that $90 piece of pie, then they can't, they can't continue to, to reduce the spending side or what they're paying pharmacies to the point that we can't accept that payment anymore and if they do keep reducing the payment and we say we can't take this plan anymore then when they remove us out of the system it hurts them because we're saving them so much on the ninety dollar piece of pie so that was kind of the whole idea behind the, the starting the CPSN in North Carolina is, is create this dependency on community pharmacy that is saving money off the, the $90 spend. We've about ratcheted down that $10 piece of pie with, with generic substitution, prior authorization as much as we can. I mean, if we, we're about at a saturation point with generic substitution. There aren't you know, many more generics that we can, we can change that to. So, so there's not a lot of savings left on that, that side of the equation. And we think that they both will feed off of each other. If we build, value and we start being very disruptive in this, in this uh, narrow network model where we become the narrow networks and, and patients are getting taken away from other pharmacies and sent to your pharmacy because of the value you bring, then they can't keep running the price down because at some point in time you'll stop taking that plan in the, in the, uh, the value that you bring, which is a real dollar value, will, will go away to them. So on uh, this slide, if you'll back up one slide, on this slide what we're really talking about today are, are kind of the four buckets of type patient in the movement uh, to this population health management from, from a fee for service management. So today it's the encounter based model. You fill the prescription fast, accurately, and cheap, and that's what you get paid for. Uh, what we want to move it to is the pre-encounter, encounter, post-encounter, post and the disengaged patient model. So the pre-encounter model is that patient that, uh, what, what happened to that patient that led them to go to the doctor or the pharmacy anyway? Then what happens in the pharmacy? What happens after they leave the pharmacy? And then the patient who's out there that's kind of, like I said earlier, may have a diagnosis of diabetes and hypertension, but is only showing up at the pharmacy to get his hydrocodone. Uh, we know from our data that the most expensive patient to the healthcare system is not the patient that takes 12 or 15 medications a month and has two uh, chronic conditions. It's a patient that has two chronic conditions that's taken zero medicines a month. So what we want to do is engage them early uh, before they, the encounter, take care of them at the encounter, follow up with them at, after the encounter, and then engage those that are disengaged. Ashley? Now. 
John, if you can advance to the next slide. Yeah, earlier, John mentioned that CCNC has um, been around for quite some time, uh, I guess now 25 years, originally created to support primary care initiatives in the state of North Carolina. And um, along that way, there was always built in um, um, you know, support systems through behavioral health or um, nutrition um, consults, um, even pharmacists embedded in clinics or hospitals, but never really um, a focus on community pharmacy involvement to support primary care initiatives in the state. Um, in a recent evaluation of, um, of enrollees within CCNC, which was about 1.4 million um, Medicare, Medicaid, and dual eligible beneficiaries in the state. Um, we noticed that of the highest risk patient populations, so those that would be demonstrated on the last column uh, where enrollees on medication management priority list is, is, is um, um, with its figures, we realized that, that these high risk patients, those in and out of the hospital, um, um, having lots of medications, lots, lots of drug therapy problems, were visiting their primary care um, physician 3.5 times per year. And um, when you compare that to how often they were um, visiting their community pharmacy, John, if you'll just advance, um, it, 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 we, sh we found that we, um, that these, this, this really sick patient population was visiting their pharmacy 35 times a year. Um, this is 35 touch points um, that definitely the most accessible um, um, health care provider that these high-risk patients were really interacting with. And so it made sense as a leverage point to start um, building in community pharmacy partnerships within communities um, where um, primary care was trying to support um, chronic um, care management. The next slide, please. So we began to look at um, the types of enhanced services that pharmacies that believe that they were providing value um, beyond just traditional dispensing services could offer and partner with um, with providers in the, in, in the overall medical neighborhood. And so this is an example of when we're talking about an enhanced services network, we're, we're talking about these types of services that pharmacies are offering that go above and beyond the traditional dispensing. So um, it may be that some of the pharmacies offer home delivery or home visits or um, have the ability to engage with others that don't speak English, um, have 24-hour services or um, have the capability of sitting down with a patient at transition of care and going through a comprehensive medication review, offering a medication synchronization program, or adherence packaging. Um, so uh, it could be a mixture of some or all of these services that um, enhanced service pharmacies are putting out there to offer to um, support chronic care management in their communities. Next slide. So what does a CPSN in North Carolina look like? Um, I, I want to go pretty high level. We won't be able to cover all the details today, but I just wanted to give you a glimpse of how it came about, what, 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 it operate, what the operations look like, and, and where we're at today with that. So starting in 2014, um, um, we began to reach out to primary care providers um, throughout um, this connected in the CC and CCNC network, and we asked those primary care providers, who are the community pharmacies in your towns, in your community, that you really enjoy working with, that if you refer to a patient, you felt really confident that that pharmacy could um, deliver on what you were asking. And so there was a large number of pharmacy names that came back, um, and so we were able to engage um, these, these pharmacies um, and, and get them in a room and start talking about why we needed a, a community pharmacy enhanced service network in our state. Um, so for one year's time, this um, voluntary network began to emerge. 
where we started to break out into work groups, define what our minimum criteria would look like. Remember, we wanted to be an, uh, a network comprised of high-performing pharmacies that believed that we were doing something different. Um, our workflow patterns were re-engineered. They, they existed to be um, patient-centered instead of product-focused um, and, and really engage with the local providers and medical neighborhoods to, to really focus on chronic management. So through these work groups, we established criteria that um, would hold ourselves, all of ourselves, to high standard and high quality. And throughout the rest of that year's time, we also began to develop um, relationships with um, care team members outside of our pharmacy. So we wanted people to know that this network existed in our state and how, um, how they could easily partner with us, how they could easily identify which enhanced services that we had so that there could be a referral pattern established. About one year later, um, we did receive recognition um, from CMS um, through their innovations grant um, that we um, were recipients of about a $15 million grant to test specific aspects of the CPSN. So um, we were to test payment models that um, seemed to be sustainable um, through a, a variety of models, so fee for service, per member per month, pay for performance, and then also um, um, determining what IT needs would be needed to really integrate community pharmacy into the medical neighborhood as well as um, and monitor and track outcomes in terms of what types of policy needs would have to occur in order to effectively and sustainably um, weave community pharmacy into health reform. And so that's kind of where we are at now, still along that testing process and, um, and, and increasing quality assurance measures. Next slide. One of the aspects that we feel really strongly about as we were working within our own state and then advancing to other states was the establishment of work groups by and for the community pharmacies that were participating. Um, we believe that there was, there was these, the, the notion of having self-imposed criteria would make the network stronger and would make um, it even high, uh, exist of high integrity. So typically when we're working with states um, and, and what we did in our own state um, was establish three work groups, one being the service set work group, one being a network operations work group, and a quality assurance and performance measurement. Each of these work groups made up by volunteers, it doesn't take a whole lot of their time, but it, it does take a little bit of time to get these this initial criteria set um, in, in this voluntary capacity. Um, they each have their own charges. Service Sets really looks at providing input on standard and optional services that you're holding yourselves out there um, as, as your value expression, and then providing input on education and communication about the services you're offering and how you will convey that to providers and other stakeholders. The next work group, the Network Operations and Communications work group, um, has the role of the charge of establishing, monitoring, and growing the CPSN. So what's the funding sustainability opportunities? What are you going to call yourselves? Um, what do you do if there is someone that um, may not be uh, meeting the criteria that was self-determined by, um, by the work group or governance? Um, how are decisions going to be made? So a lot of that is, is established by um, the, the network operations group. And then, of course, we have the quality assurance and performance measurement group um, that will exist and play a, a bigger role as the network becomes established, but really helping to set appropriate measures, um, identify who strong partners are within, um, within the, the CPSN, and then and identify a way to monitor quality in your network, as well as um, working with network operations to um, set reasonable benchmarks for participating pharmacies to um, collaborate and to be a part of the network. Next slide. This is an illustration of um, what it looks like in North Carolina. So we have, as of December of 2015, there was about 250 participating pharmacies in the network, um, primarily composed of independent community pharmacy. There's also FQHCs that are involved um, that have outpatient um, pharmacies, as well as um, we have one chain that's included in our network, um, and they have four sites, and four of their higher performing sites. Um, that um, exist within the network as well. Next slide. 
This slide just um, over, um, provides an overview of our participation criteria that was established by our work groups. And so um, in, key to um, good participation, obviously, is having current registration and, and be with good standing with the Board of Pharmacy. For our purposes, and what was um, necessary for our grant is that every participating pharmacy had to be a Medicaid provider as well as sign an agreement um, with CCNC, who was kind of our network host, that defines the scope of work and CPSN participation. Okay. So what are the key bullet points of the roles and responsibilities that every participating pharmacy must abide by? Also, because of our grant, we did require um, all of our participating pharmacies to document and share data through the pharmacy home application, which is just a documentation tool. Um, and then agreement to provide a minimum set of enhanced services. So for us, we had three minimum set. Didn't mean that our pharmacies didn't offer more of that, but they had all the participants had to at least offer these three services. Engage in proactive waste management program so that we are not just auto refilling every medication every month the patient calls, but they had to um, have an identified need for having medications, particularly when you're looking at PRNs to avoid stockpiling of, of medications. Secondly, um, provide patient counseling and adherence coaching upon referral, and then provide assistance with med reconciliation upon referral. So the three basic um, requirements that every pharmacy had to provide at a high level of quality. And of course, these um, services did have to find definitions around the processes and, and things like that so that um, everybody was doing it at a certain standard. Next slide. When we first started, um, we found um, with the, within our network that providers often didn't know what services were being offered by which community pharmacy. The, the notion of an enhanced community pharmacy network was a little hard to fathom when, uh, when you're looking from the primary care side of, of having so many patients per day and trying to keep up with which pharmacy offers which service was just very difficult. And so we um, developed what we called the collaboration card, um, outlining the name of, the, um, we broke it into region and of the state, first of all, and then we um, broke it into um, pharmacy and the contact name or contact number for the pharmacy and then a listing of the services that were offered by the pharmacy. Um, and, and so this helped to be a, a tool that was shared with a lot of the referring physicians. And now we've kind of advanced using technology to the pharmacy locator app. Um, so um, with all the pharmacies within our CPSN will be added by city, um, um, you can search by city, by um, county, by service that you're specifically looking for. And the, and the names of pharmacies in that area offering that specific service will populate. So it will be a means to um, allow easy referrals. And this can be used for patients, for caregivers, or for potential referral entities. This is also an application that will extend to use for other um, CPSNs outside of North Carolina if they wish to use this. So we see this as a really important tool. I mean, we, we hear from payers all the time, and um, hospital systems, uh, insurance payers, primary care groups that, that, you know, they know that they have problems with this patient, but to them all pharmacies look the same. They all look like the big box store on the corner, and to them their perception is that all pharmacies fill prescriptions fast, accurately, and cheap. So when they find a problem, what they like is to be able to hand that problem off to somebody who can actually do something about it. We feel this is where the pharmacy locator app comes in, is that they identify that, hey, we found this patient who doesn't have transportation and needs delivery. We can use the locator app and find a pharmacy that can actually deliver for this patient and, and help them with that problem as opposed to putting it back in the patient's hand and just saying, hey, you need to make sure you get this medicine next week. And then one of the key, I guess, um, um, aspects of our network that's it's very effective is um, helping is the ability to identify which patients that come into our pharmacy have a high risk for um, either hospitalization or identification of a drug therapy problem. So um, in this um, kind of um, green to red chart, um, color chart, you'll see that those that are in the green are, are those that um, that may be the 
person that's on middle age, person that's on one medication, really their only needs are going to uh, primary care really quickly for a, a well a well visit annually, but really not that sophisticated, not too many um, chronic diseases to manage. Um, most of their, their needs can be serviced by a pharmacy that offers high volume types of, mo of, of, of the delivery model. As you advance into patients that have more chronic diseases, that have more um, medications, um, and, and have a high risk of either return of hospital hospitalization or high risk of ED utilization, um, these are the patient population that have more complex needs and may have a need to benefit from enhanced services that could be offered. And so um, these are the patients we really want to direct and be aware of as they come into their pharmacy to really capture those encounter points. Next slide. And in doing so, you have we have the ability to kind of expose a, or show a composite score. So in this um, in this situation, this patient has an 81 risk factor, which is really um, um, that that would alert me um, to definitely spend some time, engage with this patient, build a relationship with this patient, look for any drug therapy problems, and maximize the encounter time I have with them. Whether that's just a quick conversation at point of sale or a more um, a, a more in depth conversation regarding what other services that we have that may that may they may benefit from. Moving on to the Iowa CPSN, this is the other um, recently developed um, CPSN that, that's, that's kicked off, um, if you want to just advance the slide. We had the opportunity to work pretty closely with Iowa, who set up um, their governance structure with five luminaries who um, then um, led and facilitated the progression of um, the CPSN. And so their work groups established core and optional service sets, um, the roles and responsibilities, and then began to package that into a non-legal binding participation agreement. It was really just an agreement for every pharmacy that indicated interest to say, yes, I want a part of this in this, in this phase one of the of the building, um, and I and I, I promise to um, provide these service sets as defined and adhere to the roles and responsibilities. Next slide. To give an idea of what their participation criteria um, looked like. So they did require that signed agreement. Um, they also maintained a good registration with the Board of Pharmacy and the patient's right to choose their own practitioners and pharmacies. Right now, they do not have a technology source that they're gathering around, like a central technology source, so they did build in the language to suggest that when data platforms and applications become applicable, so when a payer comes along or um, when there's an opportunity to um, begin to share different quality aspects through data exchange, um, that everybody would have to utilize that data platform and share that data um, with the network. And then um, they also had five minimum set of enhanced services that um, they ask every pharmacy to adhere to. Next slide. And this was just a timeline, as, as um, John mentioned earlier, you know, from the start of discussions to finally the launch, um, there is about an eight month um, period where it takes just to kind of organize. We can be more aggressive than that and we can help um, foster that. Um, faster, um, but just keep in mind it's not something you're going to build overnight. Um, and the downside of that is um, if a payer comes to you um, and ready to engage within a, within a high-performing network, um, you don't have it ready yet. And so that's the reason that you don't really want to delay much longer because there are value purchasers out there seeking opportunities to work with community pharmacies. Um, in this way, in this def this new type of payment model, and um, and so you don't want to go too long or consider it too long without starting to make some effort toward um, beginning to build your network. Next, yeah, slide. I think Ash is right on target with that. You, you, I, I cannot stress to you the the urgency to to start this today. You're already a year behind, and the country's a couple of years behind. I, I, I've seen this happening with primary care uh, in the physician office space and having worked with CCNC since about 2007 um, where the primary care offices are, are just going away because they didn't 
they didn't unite together quick enough. And we uh, we've worked, um, you know, we're they're they're currently in the same mode where they're scrambling to get to get united together and and uh, act as a united force. So in this example, we um, just to highlight that. This network isn't to take away product um, dispensing. This obviously is um, still a core of the business, but it's also um, um, in addition to um, while we're waiting for this payer to come, there is an opportunity to see new patients come into your pharmacy through a referral model. As you remember, I told you we existed in our network as a referral model up in, for about one year's time when we saw um, an increase of referral patterns. and so. For about um, um, for our patients that would typically refer patient ten prescriptions per patient per month, with an uh, let's just say an average of ten dollars per profit, um, our CPSM pharmacies were, were getting something like a hundred to three hundred patients per day um, referred to one of our CPSM pharmacies, and so that breaks down to about two hundred and forty thousand in annual net profit per day coming to CPSNs. Um, so just kind of think about that as you're waiting on um, a, a, a potential um, opportunity for payers to recognize this type of value. We, we never set out um, to develop um, or, or, or get into the business of network creation um, <clears throat> until we began to um, get a lot of phone calls um, from colleagues around the nation about how, this, how our network was going and, and uh, was colleagues that were interested, desperate for a new type of payment model. And so we um, went back to our project manager. We explained the kind of conversations we were having with other community pharmacies around the nation. And they said, your charge is to replicate this, so go, go do that. Um, and so um, we um, started the multi-state pharmacy collaborative with the sole purpose to facilitate expansion of high-performing networks that were focused on providing value beyond selling drug product and that would really improve um, total cost of care with the chronic care and chronic disease state patients that we managed. It was also a goal to provide a venue to connect pharmacists um, and those who have interest in delivery of financially sustainable patient-centered care. As we um, as we started, so our, our the start date, I guess, officially of the multi-state collaborative was last September. The green states indicate um, the states that maybe had con there was contact established, whether it was in a state association, a school of pharmacy, or another pharmacy colleague that really wanted to learn more about this initiative and what we were doing. And then by December, we had several states um, go into phase one of the launch process, which was really determining interest. They, um, it may have been one or a group of individuals that um, took what we had to say, went back, and began to organize some of that in their own state to say, who else wants to do this? Where, where is the interest at? Is there any level of interest for two or more people that really want to get together and start building something like this? And then it's evolved since then. If you look um, from June now to August, we have a whole variety of states that are in phase one. Phase two, which is kind of forming the network, making the governance decisions, to phase three, which those decisions are made. It's really just waiting on participation agreements to come in before the official launch. So um, we work really closely with all of these states and, and their community pharmacy partners um, to um, help support their launch. We, we, we believe we're much more successful if there are more CPSNs emerge. Next slide. Just to give you an example of an opportunity that has come up that affects your state. Um, of course, the large health system Baptist Memorial that's, I think, probably centered out of Memphis, but um, extends into your state and, and others in Mississippi as well, um, have, have expressed interest in collaborating with community pharmacies that say they're high-performing pharmacy. They, they want a place to refer patients that are complicated, that are complex, and have built-in um, um, enhanced services and they know their patients taken care of at time of discharge and so this is a pilot program that will be ongoing for um, a certain area of, of Arkansas but um, don't let that 
if you're not in that area, don't let that deter you. I just show this as an example of saying there are those out there, whether it's health systems or pharma or ACOs, that they're, they're looking for partners out there. And this is only one example of that. Um, and so this would be a natural way to connect um, the pharmacies that this may impact um, through your network. Next slide. We will guide, um, you know, you, you, it's not just Joe and I that you're hearing today. We will, we will team you up with experts from our side that um, are involved in daily operations of launch. And of course, we'll walk through with you each step of the way um, if, that is, if this is something of interest to you as we move forward. We'll develop a customized launch plan for you and, and continue to uh, make sure there's a checklist of activities that go on so that you're successful with your launch ready to take on um, contracts as, as value purchasers start to um, emerge. So I'll pause there, turn it back to John, and let's have a little dialogue about what you've heard and um, answer any questions that you may have. Yeah, thank you, Ashley. And, and I just want to comment, um, I th think everyone probably heard this, but, you know, what Joe said earlier about urging people to look at this and organize sooner rather than later. I completely agree with that. I, what our former Surgeon General recently said in a meeting with Scott and I that, you know, the hockey puck's moving down the, the ice and you want to make sure that you're with the hockey puck and not, you know, somewhere off on the side doing what you think is the right thing, but you're not really with the hockey puck. So I think this is a really great vision and APA uh, Board of Directors and um, and others in our state that have had conversations about this prior to this webinar really feel like this is a good um, fit for uh, any pharmacies that are, are willing and interested. Uh, I will uh, go to the audio now and unmute and see if there are any questions. If you have a question, there should be a, um, a little raise your hand feature next to your name. That might be one way to get my attention. And let's get here to where I can unmute the attendees. And I'm talking to myself. Here we go. Unmute all. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Okay. Don't see any questions yet on the chat. It looks like there's a lot of thank yous and great presentations. Uh, I'll tell you what, you've got Ashley's email address there on the slide. And once again, my email address is John, J-O-H-N, at A-R-R-X <clears throat> dot org. And if you have any other follow-up questions, please send those to us. Of course, we're going to talk about this at district meetings. They begin tomorrow night in Hot Springs. We're going to visit 11 cities over the next six weeks and look forward to having more discussion. We'll have two more webinars to provide more information, and we look forward to having this thing launched um, within the next... I'm going to say six months, Ashley, instead of eight. So I'm, I'm optimistic that folks will really um, take to this and, and we'll get this thing going. So I just really want to thank you, Ashley, and Joe as well for joining today and appreciate everything you're doing. And just want to thank everyone for attending today. We had <clears throat> close to 70 people and appreciate your time. And we'll see you at district meetings. Thanks a lot.